Judging from the pageantry and the enthusiasm which surrounds almost every sporting event, there is a lot of interest for most people of all ages in the United States. In today's podcast, a master teacher will explain how he uses sports to cull the geographic interest of his middle school students. You are listening to a podcast created by the Minnesota Alliance for Geographic Education. Our mission is to help you understand your world better through geography. Some devices accessing this podcast will be able to show pictures, maps, chapters, titles, and clickable links. Our presenter is Master Teacher Craig Haddam. Craig teaches 8th grade geography at Hibbing High School. He is currently and has been a member of the Minnesota Alliance for Geographic Education Steering Committee. He has also been a presenter at a variety of geographic workshops for many years. Craig served on the Minnesota Council for Social Studies Board from from 1989 to 2005. He was voted Hibbing Public School Teacher of the Year in 2010. His professional goal is to get rid of paper and go entirely paperless in his classroom by 2015. I am Fred Kunze, a member of the Minnesota Alliance for Geographic Education. I'm here with Craig Haddam, who is a master teacher at Hibbing High School. And today he's going to talk about an activity that he uses, and he'll explain his understanding of the difference between an activity and what you might normally do in the classroom. So, Craig, what do you have for us today? Uh, I'm going to talk today, Fred and everybody out there, about the geography, about using sports in geography. I think much of the sports work that I'm going to mention now doesn't necessarily fit into a state standard. It's more an activity. And I I like really well, I heard Sharon Shellroot say one time, that activities are things that you do in the classroom that aren't necessarily attached to the state standards, whereas lesson plans are something that are attached to the state standards. And I use the geography of sport or different kinds of sport at two times during the year. Sometimes, because I teach geography all day long, I have a need to fill in part of the day with something that my other classes that are going to be interrupted for whatever reason, don't necessarily have to know or understand. And so it really is an activity, by Sharon's definition, not a lesson plan where we part of a standard that all my students would have to achieve. And so I use sports a couple of times that way, and I have reasons for using sports. Well, one reason is probably that it's a fairly good motivator for oh, kids to... K- kids really like it. Kids like the... Uh, like the fact that they get to talk about an activity they really like a lot, whether it's the stuff we normally think of as sports like baseball or hockey or basketball or soccer, but some other things too. Uh, Kids, I have a unit I do with a little bit of activity I do about deer hunting and environmental change in Minnesota. And in northern Minnesota where I live, deer hunting is a really big activity. And around the opening of deer hunting, I always kind of throw that activity in somewhere because I'll have days Deer hunting opens up on a Saturday in November, and usually the Friday the day before and the Monday after, there are kids that are going to be gone. Sometimes a third of my students will be gone on one of those days to do something with deer hunting. And so I I throw that deer hunting activity out then with that idea that when they come back or while they're gone, it's an interesting moment. It's that moment of getting them at their maximum interest. And, And I know over the years, sometimes kids have realize that geography has an importance because in one of these sports activities I've explained it in a geographic way. The other thing that is happening is more and more sport is is digitizing its playing field. For example, baseball did it first where Joe Maurer would hit his hit to regularly. They now have almost like a map and they know where Joe Maurer hits to, they know where his strike zone is, uh, I think Major League Bra- Baseball breaks the strike zone into nine different plate pieces. And it's where the ball went through, where he hit it, and they have a really strong record of information now about where Joe Maurer hits and where he doesn't hit and where he normally hits it out to. And soccer has the same thing now, where a soccer player has given, I guess it would call it an assist, where that spot was on the field to where the guy kicked the goal to where it actually went into the goal. And right now, because we have the World Cup going on, there's data about showing where the where they kick the where they have to kick an overtime. We'll call it an overtime shot. I forget what they call it—a shootout. And uh, and in those shootouts, they know exactly what percentage goes in what part of the net. 
and they know where these players who are going to be kicking the ball, where they normally kick it as well. And so it's a game of almost like hide and seek or hide the ball underneath the right cup so that when a guy kicks it, he's going to kick it somewhere where the goalie isn't going to be. And so there's a lot of data out there that way. Basketball, you can find on the Internet now uh, a record of every made basket that uh, Kevin Durant has taken. And it's really interesting. They're either all right beyond the three-point line, and then at the three-point line in a little bit, there's almost nothing. And then there's more shots scored again. It's like the three-point line is at some magic spot. He has to be on one side or the other. And there's really good data about it. And so there are some reasons. When I used to show do some geography of sports with teachers, uh, there are some reasons. Sports is a major economic activity. It affects the landscape. You can look at an aerial photo, and you know where the football fields, the soccer fields, the baseball fields are located because you can see them. Golf is a great example in this case. You know, when a golf course is on, on, on an aerial photo, you pick it up right away. It's usually lined, The holes are usually lined by trees, and it's fairly obvious that what you're looking at there. Uh, the environment affects the outcome of, of different sporting events, uh, both in the way of the actual playing of the game, but sometimes uh, where a person learns their game. You learn it, hockey is very much a Great Lakes around the Great Lakes learned activity. There are not as many people who come from, say, Texas or Florida. Uh, much like the, some of the best skiers in the, Nor in the world are from Norway and Sweden and Austria, where there's snow and mountains, and the whole country is made up of those places. Geography and sport are concerned with how people and objects interact with each other, so it's a great way to do that. And there's also a large amount of data. For example, we just had the Major League Baseball draft, and every team takes like 20 players in a draft. There's like 20 rounds. And so there's 600 people that have been drafted into baseball a few weeks ago, and newspapers and websites will show where they went to school or where they were born, and you can organize that data, and kids can map that out. That's a really good place to do it. And uh, another one there about reasons why you should do it is kids just like it, like we've mentioned. The other thing is when I take this up during the year, sometimes it's geographic and sometimes it's not. I mentioned the environmental geography one, but there's also an opportunity in the spring for my students with fishing opener to look at exotic nuisance species and some of the problems the Great Lakes or even the state of Minnesota is having with different exotics in, in our aquatics. Canada, you can do something on the NHL. It is their national game. In South America, as I mentioned, it's the, we're in the we're in the we're in the World Cup right now. But in two years, um, the Olympics are in Brazil, and so you have that issue of looking at a little bit of maybe uh, Brazil may have bitten off a little bit more than it can chew. It might not be able to afford these games, and you have some unrest and some riots over the money that's being spent on these venues instead of on the regular population. Uh, I always for Martin Luther King. Day. I always do Jackie Robinson Day on April 15th instead. For those people who don't know, Jackie Robinson was the first African American to play Major League Baseball and across the color line. And his his the day in baseball is April 15th. And I always do something about Jackie Robinson around around that April 15th day. Uh, there's some great work out there by a man named Robert Whiting as he compares the way the Japanese play baseball to the way we in America play baseball. And if you look up Robert Whiting, his name, his last name is spelled W-H-I-T-I-N-G. And the book that first got me interested with Robert Whiting's work, uh, Whiting's work was the 1988 book, the, uh, You've Got to Have Wa. Wa is spelled W-A, and Wa is your maintaining the group feeling that everybody's together. And a lot of these American baseball players that show, show up with the exact opposite interest in bringing Wah to the team, they're mostly a disruptive force. Um, you can also find a lot of work out there. There's a man named John Bale who used to write about sports geography. And the thing I always took away from Mr. Bale's work was the idea that every sport starts as a folk game it's something somebody's playing a little bit for fun. They've made it up. And then after other people catch on, their team, teams get made. Neighborhoods come up against each other. Or different towns start to play the game. And then after a while, you have to establish a rulemaking body. Because if Hibbing's playing 
Edina in some made up game, eventually you have to come up with the rules. So everybody understands what the rules are going to be. And then the other people catch on to the sport. And then as it spreads to other countries, eventually you end up with this international bureaucracy to oversee a sport. So you take something like golf that started very informally in Scotland. And because the English spread it to the rest of the world, now has an international bureaucracy with it. Baseball the same way. Basketball very much that way. Uh, it started out that way. And so there's some really good things there to look at. So beyond the, the maps you might bring in and the issues you might yeah. talk about, there's an, some of these are very good examples of cultural diffusion. Yes. very much cultural diffusion. And you can use the different models of cultural diffusion to talk about how a game spreads and develops over time. And that's the, one of the great things I learned from, from John Bale's work was the, the idea that, that this, these ideas would diffuse but as they diffused, they also created their own hierarchy uh, that, every, that nearly every sport that, that you and I watch or see on television has that hierarchy in place now. Uh, the, la the last thing to go along with some of this is some of the reasons why a region might become a, a sports talent producer. And you have climate. Climate's a big part of it. As much as many northern Minnesotans wish they could be professional golfers, they got about 90 or 100 days to play golf outside every year. And then you throw in the rain and the odd problems. And you're never, compared to somebody in Florida or Texas, who will have like 300 days. Every year you're going by in Minnesota, you're getting one-third of the time in of people who are in warmer climates. And the reverse is true of something like hockey. Where, where there's a lot more opportunity to become good at hockey in the northern climates than there is in, say, again, Florida or Texas. Another one is the size of the population. You may really like your area, you may really like the activity, but if you have 100 people in your town, you, you're probably not going to be an 11-man football power in Minnesota. You might. It might be a unique situation, but you need a population. Then there's the thing about wealth. You have to be able to provide facilities, not just actually where the game is played, but to train your athletes nowadays. So a game like American football has a little harder time catching on around the world because of the expense of helmets and padding and a whole new kind of field that has to be set up. And the last one I always like to point out, and I remind kids of it all the time, is a culture produces what a culture values. You, if you va value fine violin playing in your, in your area of the world, you're going to produce a lot of fine violinists. If you value gymnastics, you're going to produce your gymnastics. Um, and so I think a culture produces what it values. And it gives you a chance to look and see, what does this culture value when you're looking at the kind of sport or sports that they produce quality athletes in? Or any really activity. You have these places in in Eastern Europe that people for a long time trained in chess and they're still producing the best chess players in the world. Now you, we could say chess isn't a sport in, in, our, in our more old fashioned way of looking at it, but it is a competition between two people to win a game. And so there, there is all these different ways you can look at where, where or a student could or a teacher could develop some information about sport. Uh, winning a game and participating in a game and I think the last thing to point out there is the way you look at now here in the Twin Cities, one of the great cycling areas in the United States, not necessarily for producing competitive cyclists, but people who are on their bikes a lot. And so you have to develop a different kind of uh, roads, trails, uh, opportunities for all these cyclists to get from one point to another, whether they're in training or they're just riding their bike to get to work and back and they're commuting. So there's a lots of opportunities there for you, Fred, for, and for people out there to take a look at in terms of uh, sports and geography and the opportunities that can come from it. So don't be afraid to use geography, to use sports in your geography. No, you shouldn't be afraid at all. You shouldn't be at all. Thank you, Craig. You have been listening to a production of the Minnesota Alliance for Geographic Education. Background music is courtesy of Jim Hogue of Decorah, Iowa. The Minnesota Alliance is a nonprofit group of educators and other parties who are interested in promoting an enhanced understanding of our world through improved geographic literacy.